I didn't turn on my microphone. Sorry guys, welcome back. Okay, so again the question is, what is the most important concept in chapter 19? And guesses are fine, but you're going to have to leave me the right to say no. What do you think, Catherine? Um, it's not. Entropy is a part of it, but it, entropy is big. But it's not the most important thing in the chapter. Go ahead. It's spontaneity. And so, guys, the question is now this. How do we know that that is the most important thing in the chapter. And I would suggest to you there's two ways we know. One, it's at the end. It actually permeates the entire chapter, but the culmination, if you will, the resolution, the apex of the plot, as if chemistry books have plots. But guys, the end of this is, is it spontaneous? So guys, let's let the cat out of the proverbial bag. How are we finally going to seek resolution to this issue, which is, is a reaction spontaneous? Because there's only one answer. How do you know if a reaction spontaneous? Gibbs free energy. That's it. Guys, that is it. So what you're going to find out is at the end of the day, not today, but at the end of this unit, you are going to get an always. And guys, you understand how precious these are in this class, right? We tend to use words like usually, tends to, often, because we always leave ourselves these ridiculous little ways out, right? Because there's always exceptions to rules. Guys, you're going to get in always. And the always is going to connect spontaneity with Gibbs free energy. Because Gibbs free energy is in always. And I'll just tell you, if you get a negative delta G, a negative Gibbs free energy change, that reaction is always spontaneous. Always no exceptions forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So guys, that is where this is all headed. And that is how the AP authors are going to get at this. That's the reason we really know this is the most important is because this is what you're going to be tested on on the AP test. All of these thermodynamics questions that you're going to end up with, the last question 98% of the time is, is this reaction spontaneous and how do you know? And that's where this is all headed. So guys, you may as well write down the answer. What is the most important thing in chapter 19? Spontaneity. I can't spell it either, so get close. I think there's like E's and I's in there somewhere. Spontan E I T Y. I think there's a Q. A Z. There's a silent B in there. A silent B. Okay, guys, so in order for us to get into this conversation about spontaneity, what we need to do first is we need to have a review of chapter five. So guys, let's talk about the big chunks in chapter five. So you guys tell me, what are the big chunks in chapter five? What are the big concepts? And then we'll relate them all together. Enthalpy, not entropy, that's 19. Enthalpy, heat, work, energy, what two kinds? Kinetic and potential. What does the first law of thermodynamics say about those things? It's all conserved. So when we talk about conservation, what happens when kinetic becomes potential and potential becomes kinetic? What's the net change? Zero. So guys, and we understand that kinetic becomes potential and potential becomes kinetic through the avenues of work and heat, right? No. Guys, kinetic can become potential and potential becomes kinetic. And that doesn't require work and heat because those are both internal energies. A body can have kinetic and potential and those can interconvert. If you don't remember, think about the block. We raised the block doing work on it and its internal energy went up. Then when we dropped it, what was potential became kinetic as it accelerated and its velocity went up. But guys, the potential and kinetic, the sum of those is always the same, assuming we're not losing energy to the surroundings. So guys, kinetic and potential energy, which the total of which is internal energy, 
energy doesn't need to go through work and heat in order to one become the other. And the sum of them is always the same so long as we're not gaining or losing energy from the surroundings. So then the important thing is we talk system and surroundings. How do we get energy between the system and the surroundings? How does energy go between system and surrounding? Now it's heat and work. So guys, we have these ideas then that if this is the system and everything else is the surroundings, energy can go in and out of the system through those two avenues, work and heat. Now, to kind of round that out then, what we did is we said, let's get rid of work. So guys, remind yourselves, what two things have got to be present for work to be done? No, 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 no. What two things have got to be present for work to be done? Movement against resistance. And so then we said, we're going to get rid of work. And to get rid of work, we're not going to get rid of movement. We're going to get rid of resistance. And now, Daniel, how do we do that? Open, open containers. Because guys, open containers are these magic fictitious containers that provide no resistance to movement. And as a result, there's no resistance, there's no work. If there's no work, the only way to get energy in and out is heat. And what do we call heat in the absence of work? Enthalpy. You get the idea? Okay. Now guys, as we talk about enthalpy, we lent some terms to this. And as we talked about enthalpy, we said that if a system is losing energy through the avenue of, of heat, enthalpy, if, 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 if we're losing energy through that avenue of heat or enthalpy, we use them interchangeably, if we're losing energy, what do we call that? Exothermic. Exothermic. And then if the energy is coming in, it's endothermic. And guys, what is the sign for delta H if it's exothermic? Negative because we're in the system and it's losing energy. If energy comes in, it's positive because it's gaining energy. And then we talked about how we quantify and measure those things because we talked about Hess's law. And we can do that empirically through calorimetry or computationally through manipulation or that equation that is products minus reactants. Is that a glorious review of chapter five? Yeah. You guys good? Okay. And that was all recorded in case you want this before the test. Okay. So where does that leave us? What do we need to bring from chapter five to be successful in chapter 19? And guys, the thing that you need to bring forward into this new unit, into this new chapter, the end of the unit is enthalpy. Enthalpy, as we just said, is the release of energy from the system into the, it could be the other direction. It's the exchange of energy between the system and the surroundings through the avenue of heat in the absence of work. You good to go? Okay, is, are we really cemented on that? Because we're about to talk about it in a new context. You're okay? Okay. So guys, now we're ready to take this idea and we are ready to bring it into our conversation about the most important topic, which is the concept of spontaneity, which you already wrote down, or the concept of spontaneous processes. So guys, there's 11 different ideas bouncing around in your brains. Probably there are as many ideas as there are people in this room about what is spontaneity. Guys, this is the quick and dirty definition that you need to understand. What is a spontaneous process? A spontaneous process is a process, or in chemistry land, a reaction, which occurs on its own without any outside intervention. And again, guys, this is the big nugget, right? You have got to be able to determine, is this reaction spontaneous? Again, the culmination of this conversation next week is it's all about Gibbs free energy but we've got to understand it right now conceptually. So guys, the thing that tends to trip people up about this is this idea of intervention. What does it mean that the surroundings are intervening with the system? So guys, in order to help you make better sense of this, what I'd like to do is sort of develop this concept of spontaneity. So guys, the question that we really need to talk about is what characteristics make reactions spontaneous. 
We haven't even really talked about spontaneity yet. We haven't talked about examples. We haven't looked at what this idea of intervention means. But guys, I think if we can talk characteristics before we talk specifics, I think that this will work better for you in your brains. So guys, let me give you part of the answer to the question. So what has to be true of a reaction for it to be spontaneous? And guys, the answer is this. They're energy losers. Spontaneous reactions tend to be energy losers. You guys there? So let me ask you a question. Why did we just spend the last 10 minutes reviewing chapter 5? Given what you just wrote down, why did we spend the last 10 minutes reviewing chapter 5? Ah, but back up just a little bit, Catherine. That's the end game, and you're right on it. Because why did we review chapter? What's chapter 5 all about? How we gain and lose energy. Heat, water, kinetic potential, back and forth, first law of thermo. That's the entire chapter 5. And guys, now we know this. We know that reactions that are spontaneous are energy losers. But what are the two ways a system can lose energy to the surroundings? Work and heat, and what if we get rid of work? What are we left with? Heat, and what do we call reactions that are heat losers? Exothermic. So guys, you may want to write this down. It's not in the notes, but you may want to include it. Guys, reactions that are spontaneous, you're not going to like this, tend to be, sorry, reactions that are spontaneous tend to be energy, I'm sorry, tend to be exothermic. So you ready? Let's start simple. I think a lot of you actually, I didn't, you know I graded your chapter 19 summaries really quickly, so I didn't get to look. Did any of you draw something like that? The ball on the hill? Oh yeah, you couldn't tell that was the ball on the hill? I don't even want to know what you thought it was if you couldn't tell it was the ball on the hill. That's the ball on the hill. And guys, the idea is this. If you have a ball on a hill, why can this only be a picture and not a video? Because that ball ain't going to stay there, right? That is impossible. That, can't, that can only be a picture. It can't be a video because that ball is not going to be there in about a quarter second. Where is that ball headed? To the bottom. And guys, of course you all know that in order to get that ball to head to the bottom, there's also got to be a person here pushing that ball down the hill, right? No. No. That ball rolls downhill all on its own. You don't have to talk to it. You don't have to encourage it. You don't have to push it. You don't have to blow on it. That ball is going to roll downhill. What does that make it? Spontaneous. See, guys, this is what intervention looks like. And this is what spontaneous looks like in a macro scale physical sense. The idea, guys is spontaneous processes happen without outside intervention. That ball is rolling downhill. Now, you understood something. We said these are energy losers. So what do you now know about that ball rolling downhill because you now know it's spontaneous? It's losing energy. Guys, those always go hand in hand. If something is spontaneous, it's an energy loser. And if it's an energy loser, it will be spontaneous. Those are always equivalent processes. Go ahead. Well, but realize we're not at the top. We're going to talk about that later because in a chemical sense, what you're talking about is activation energy, the energy to get something started. The trick is this. Yeah, so if, if we could... 
perch that ball right on the top, it's not going to move, right? But if it's either slightly off center or if we give it a nudge, then it's going to roll. So the nudge doesn't count. But once you've given it, and I'll, we'll talk chemical nudges in a minute, but once you've given it the nudge, you don't have to keep nudging, right? And that's the intervention. It doesn't count if it's one flick, but if it's continual flicks. So for example, if the ball was down here, could we make it go back uphill? Well, yeah, but now we got to flick it, right? So that is what we call non-spontaneous. It can go in the other direction, but now the, the surroundings have got to act on it the whole way. Do you see the distinction? Okay. So guys, do you get the idea here, ball rolling downhill? Now let's talk about this because we did something like this, right? We didn't roll a ball downhill. We dropped a block. But the only difference between rolling and dropping is the, the incline. So guys, talk to me about what kind of energy this thing's losing. Potential. Potential being converted to kinetic, but we understand that is not a net loss of energy other than the fact that it's eventually going to stop because there is resistance. So this isn't a heat work thing. There's still work being done because the ball is pushing air out of the way. And eventually we understand that it'll stop. But I think we can see that potential is becoming kinetic and then the kinetic is being lost to the surroundings through work and friction and heat and all these other things. But we should understand that this is a net energy loser right? And then I think if you think about it, given what Catherine was saying, could you also see that we can push the ball uphill, but now we've got to add energy to it, just like picking up the block. You comfortable with the idea? Okay. So now guys, let's take this out of the realm of balls rolling downhill. I don't know if you want to write that down as a mental placeholder. But guys, now, now let's take it into the, the realm, the world, if you will, of chemistry. Here's an example. Hydrocarbons burning. We could even write a balanced equation. CH4, O2, CO2, H2O, not going to balance it. So guys, where do we see this take place? Oh, you're still writing. I forget. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> that would be horrid. So guys, where does this process take place in your world? Every time you light a Bunsen burner. CH4 is methane, which is predominantly natural gas. There is some, some beauty. Eth, meth, there, meth, eth, there is some methane in there as well, but it's mostly methane, CH4. So guys, this is what happens when you light your Bunsen burner. Now, this is where, Catherine, we talk about the nudge. So guys, if we were to um, bring a Bunsen burner in here, and you've done it so much, I don't need to show you, but imagine if we brought in a Bunsen burner, turned on the gas, and then just stood there. Is it going to just spontaneously catch on fire? No. But as soon as we give it that spark, do we need to do anything to keep it burning? Do we need to hold the striker there and keep hitting that thing with sparks in order to keep it lit? That's the nudge. That is the same nudge that we talk about with the ball at the top of the hill. So the, the methane and the oxygen need a nudge, just like a ball needs a nudge if it's perched at the top of the hill. The ball, it's literally a nudge. With the methane and the oxygen, the nudge is the spark. The spark does not count when we talk about outside intervention. The outside intervention piece comes after the nudge. So if you have to keep nudging, then it is not spontaneous, like rolling the ball uphill or having to continue to add spark to keep the gas burning. But once you give it the nudge, if it goes on its own, then it is spontaneous. Does that make sense? You get the idea? Do you see the distinction? Okay. So now, guys, I want to I wanna lay this one on you. Here's another example, and I show you this example because the AP authors love to nitpick this point. Nails rusting. OK, 
Can we write the chemical equation? This one I will balance. That's the chemical equation for the formation of rust, assuming it's an iron nail. So guys, first of all, let's do this. Is nail rusting, nails are, is, are, are, is the rusting of a nail a spontaneous process? What do you have to do to get a nail to rust? Nothing. Just sit the stupid thing out in the room and it's going to rust, right? You don't have to, come on nail, let's rust. You don't have to do anything to encourage rusting. All you got to do is sit the nail out because now what is the nail exposed to? Oxygen and it's going to rust. But it doesn't happen very fast, does it? And Daniel, that's where I take exception with what you said. Understand in a good way. But Daniel said, I know that this is, I, he, uh, he said, I asked the question, is a nail rusting spontaneous? And Daniel's answer was, it's exothermic. Really? Have you ever touched a rusty nail and went, oh, that's hot? Oh, yeah, and that's the point. Guys, understand that, that, I mean, yes, the rusting of a nail is exothermic, but the rate of this reaction is so ridiculously slow that that nail is going to be at room temperature. Within our abilities to measure temperature, that nail is room temperature, even though this process is exothermic. So guys, understand that if the rate of a reaction is slow enough, you're not going to experience the heat that's given off. So the question you want to think about is, does this happen on its own, even if it's stupid slow? Because you know, guys, if I were to set a nail rate here and then we were to come back on Monday, what's the nail going to look like? The same. But if we come back in a decade, what's the nail going to look like? A rusted ball of yuck. So we understand, guys, that it is happening. It's just happening so slow, it's almost imperceivable. Therefore, the heat that's released is also hard to keep track of. I think you know the answer to that. Why do some things need a nudge where other things don't? We talked about it last year. Let me draw a picture. Here we have reactants. Here we have products. This is energy. When reactants become products, they don't do this. They do this. What's the nudge? You got to get over the hump. What do we call the hump? Activation energy. That's the hump. The reason some of these need a nudge is because you need to add that minimal amount of energy called activation energy to get the process started. Does that make sense? Okay. But we will answer that question later. Understand right now the quick and dirty answer is activation energy. But guys, this is important that you understand this. Are you guys all settled with this? What would the delta H be for the burning of methane? Negative. negative. Hugely negative, right? Bamboozles of energy. What is the delta H for the rusting of iron? Negative. But guys, it could also still be hugely negative. It's just spread over a pant load of time. You may actually release more energy rusting a mole of iron than you do burning a mole of methane. It's just that this energy is released over so much time that it's so spread out it's imperceivable. But we do know for sure that this is negative. Does that make sense? Okay, now here's the thing you got to keep track of, guys. I can almost guarantee you this question is going to be on the test. They will ask you something like, well, how can I, I'm trying to see if I can phrase it relative to these two examples. How, how would they do it with this? They would say something like, uh, 
I don't even know if they could do it with this. Let me just tell you what they like to nitpick. They like to nitpick at this relationship between reaction rate and spontaneity. Because people have this idea, and it was actually funny. I know, Ethan, you didn't mean to do this, but you did anyway. Um, when I said, let's talk about spontaneous, and I said, what does it mean to be spontaneous? And Ethan went, like spontaneous means happy, like Catherine was earlier. And it's just full of energy and jumping all around and doing all of this. And so you've got this idea that spontaneous means bubbly and moving and, and vibrant, fast. Guys, spontaneity doesn't mean fast. It just means happens. And it doesn't have to happen fast. So guys, they will ask you questions on the test. They'll even ask you this. Which one of these, re ooh, they'll ask you this. Which one of these reactions is more spontaneous? There's no such thing. Either you happen or you don't. You can't be more spontaneous. You can be non-spontaneous, but you can't be more spontaneous. Guys, there is not a connection between spontaneity and rate. You can have spontaneous reactions that happen really fast. You can have spontaneous reactions that happen really slow. It's either you are or you aren't. Do you get the idea? What do you need to write down so that you'll remember that? Because that's not in the notes. What do you need to write down? Could you write down something like no such thing as more spontaneous? Sure. Maybe. I mean, that makes sense to me. So guys, but the critical point is there is no connection between spontaneity and rate. Rate is its completely different thing. How are we doing? Y'all okay? Good. Are you done writing? Do you need it? I know you're writing your own things and I want to give you a second to process. That's good? Okay, go ahead. That's beautiful, beautiful. That's exactly the point. So I love that you asked the question. I'm just saying, why? Why is it that reactions that lose energy are spontaneous? Um, we're going to have to couch that for two more class periods because to talk about that, we, we have to get over the little awkward position that I'm about to put us in. And then we need to talk about entropy. And as soon as we can get our arms around the complete picture, then we can answer that question. But that's exactly where we want to go with this. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what we got to do next. Okay. So guys, let me take us collectively to that point. So are we all sold on the idea that balls rolling downhill, hydrocarbons burning, and nails rusting are all spontaneous processes? You good? How do we know they are all spontaneous processes? Because they all happen. There's no nudging. They just happen. And now we talked about this, and Daniel brought this up, which was great. They all have negative delta H's. They're all exothermic. They're all giving away energy. You good? No, well, uh, no, no. no all I'm the oh. Yeah, all these examples. Okay. So now, guys, I want you to do this. Write down this. Write this down with me. Sorry, I thought that was a trick question. It's about to be. I'm glad that you know enough to not trust me. Write this one down. So for those of you that have passed the summer quiz, you can tell me the name of the compound on the left. If you can't, I'm going to change your summer quiz grade back to zero. I can name it. Because the substance on the left is ammonium chloride. Why did I write the water above the line rather than uh, as a reactant? Because exactly, this is the way we represent solution processes. So what we're looking at here 
is the, the dissolving of ammonium chloride. So where on earth are we going to find some ammonium chloride in some water? Well, guys, the answer is right here. You hear those beads sloshing around in... Actually, they're not sloshing around Yeah, You hear those beads? Those are actually pellets of ammonium chloride. This is a quick cold pack. And if you've ever played with a quick cold pack, you may know that there's a bladder inside the outer blad, the outer bag. You can sort of see it squish around. So now we've got, you can almost sort of see some of them, the ammonium chloride pellets down here at the bottom, and then you've got this bladder inside of here above it. But we do this, and now they're all spread out. But guys, what do you suppose is inside the bladder? Water. Water. And if you've never used a quick cold pack, what you do is, is you smash it. And when you smash it, you're actually breaking the inner bladder and it just bluffs water all throughout the outside thing and then you shake it. And when you do that, what is the ammonium chloride now doing in the water? It's doing this. This is the chemical representation of what is going on inside the quick cold pack. So now guys, let's talk about our system. What's our system? Look at the board. What's our system? The pellets and the water. So what does that make us? And more importantly, what does that make your bruised knee? The surroundings. And the fact that your bruised knee gets cold when you put this on here tells you that energy is moving in which direction? Into the bag into the system and out of your knee. So guys, if energy is moving into the system through the avenue of heat, what is our delta H value for this process? Positive. Good. It's endothermic. But now guys, when I crush this bag, that's my nudge, when I crush this bag and give it a shake, do I have to keep shaking it to keep it cold? No, it stays cold. So is it spontaneous? Now we have a problem. Yes, it is spontaneous. I don't have to continue to nudge this to get it to continue to dissolve and thereby take in energy. So guys, now we've created this moment of crisis. And if you don't understand why this is a crisis, you got to get with this. So we are now talking about a process that is clearly endothermic. That's why we use it as a cold pack. But we also now know that it is spontaneous because we don't have to continue, as the surroundings, we don't have to continue to intervene to continue to get this to go. Do you agree with those two ideas? But because this is endothermic, we know that the, or because the delta H is positive, because it's taking in energy, now we have a tension. Because earlier, we established the idea that negative delta H's, these guys, negative delta H's are spontaneous. And we even said this, they lose heat. Where did we say that? They lose energy. We talked about this idea that, that spontaneous processes lose energy, and now we have an example of a, of a process that's an energy gainer, and it's spontaneous. So guys, how do we resolve this tension? How do we resolve this tension that we had what seemed to be an important and understandable principle? Balls roll downhill and not up. But now we're talking about a ball that magically rolls uphill, right? Because guys, fundamentally, that's what this is doing. This is a ball rolling uphill. It's taking in energy and it's spontaneous. So how do we resolve the conflict? Do you understand the conflict? Now the question is, how do we resolve it? And guys, we, and if you want to write this down, you can. The big exception, which is the quick cold pack. Someday I fear I'm going to need this quick cold pack in lab, and then I'm not going to have my demonstration piece. 
going to be a very sad day. So guys, let's do this. If you don't understand the problem, let me give it to you in a very concise fashion. It's this. If energy must be lost to the surroundings in order for a reaction to be spontaneous, how do we explain the quick cold pack exception? I know you like writing things down, so I'll give you a second to write it down. Because guys, I would propose to you that there's really two answers to this question. But guys, before we can talk about the two answers, again, it's critical you understand the question. So the reasoning goes like this. We established earlier that things that lose energy happen spontaneously, and we looked at three examples. Then we brought in the quick cold pack, and we agreed, one, that it's spontaneous, we don't have to keep shaking it, and two, it's endothermic which is a direct violation of the rule that we established earlier, which talked about the idea that energy losers are the ones that happen spontaneously. Are y'all caught up with me? You're okay? So guys, I would propose to you this. There's two ways for us to resolve the conflict. One is this. This could be wrong, right? This is this rule. We said that energy losers are spontaneous. Now we see an example of a spontaneous reaction that's not an energy loser. So possibly this could just not be right. It could be that in fact you don't have to be an energy loser to be spontaneous. Guess what? That's not the answer. You have to be an energy loser in order to be spontaneous. Now the tension got worse, right? Just a second. Now the tension got worse, right? Because that's the easy out. The easy out is, well, maybe energy doesn't really determine spontaneity. It does. You have to be an energy loser in order to be spontaneous. So now you're going, then what the crap? What's going on here? And guys, the answer is this. You just don't understand this well enough. Because if you really understood energy, you would find out that this is losing energy even though it's cold. And that's where we're headed next. So guys, do you understand where we're at? We is, and let's, let's do this by review. So we understand that to be spontaneous, again, it means happens on its own. To be spontaneous, you've got to be an energy loser. We looked at examples, balls downhill, burning things, rusting things, all exothermic, even if it's really slow. They're all energy losers, even if it's really slow. Now we've got an energy gainer that's spontaneous, and that causes tension because we don't understand how that can be. If the rule is lose energy, how can gain energy be spontaneous? And then we give ourselves two ways out. It could be that this ain't true that you don't have to be an energy loser to be spontaneous, that would have been a relief, right? But it turns out that's not the way this works. You have to be an energy loser. We just don't fully understand energy. So guess what we need to do now in order to move forward and resolve the conflict? Where's the energy going? And the answer, guys, is not through enthalpy. And that's the point of chapter 19. So let's do questions, but we've been waiting. Kimmy, go ahead. Are you sure? Good. Let's talk in a minute. We're going to look at some eggs. And, and here's what you're going to find, Brandon. We're, we're about to get into a moment, if you will, where it's going to be really hard to give you practical examples. And we're going to use, on the next slide, phase changes as examples because we can, we can picture ice melting. We can picture water freezing. And we're going to do that. So we're going to use phase changes as examples in just a minute. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah, good. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And that's, we're not ready to talk about it, but yes. Yep. So guys, allow me to offer you this then as maybe a transitional moment. Our problem is that our definition of energy is too narrow. Now, guys, you're not going to like this. Actually, you're going to hate this so much that I'm not going to do this to you. Nah. It's the whole weekend. You wouldn't survive. No, so, so, okay. Uh, okay, so, guys, what is the answer to the mystery? And the answer is disorder. There's another way that a system can gain and lose energy other than heat. And Matt, I'm going to make the connection for you right now. There's another way that a system can gain and lose energy. And that is by changing the disorder of the universe. So ready? I am, I'm organizing all of your stuff. Okay, now it's all organized, right? It's not very disordered. So now I'm increasing the disorder of your stuff, but what did I have to do to do that? Work. Work. And that's the idea that what systems can do, where did I, sorry, I'm throwing your stuff all over. I didn't throw your phone though. That was good, right? So the, those are mine. What you're going to find out is that the other, and guys, this is, this is two days down the road, but I couldn't let you sit for the weekend. You wouldn't make it. So guys, the other way that systems can gain and lose energy is by changing the disorder of the things around them. And so what we're going to find out later is that the reason that this happens on its own is because as the pellets dissolve into the water, their disorder goes up. And that is a driving force, just like losing heat, exothermic. That is a driving force that causes processes to happen. It's called entropy, and we're going to get there next week. We're going to let that hang in the air right now, but eventually that's where we're headed, is we will actually be able to calculate the increase in disorder as this stuff dissolves. And you will find, this is interesting, you'll find out that the amount of disorder that goes up, measured in joules, you can measure disorder in joules. The amount that this disorder goes up is greater than the amount of heat that it takes in. And as a result, it actually causes it to be spontaneous. We'll get there in a couple days. Okay. So guys, where do we need to go then? So we understand our definition of energy is too narrow. I now told you the answer. It's entropy. But guys, along the way, we've got to build into this idea. So to do this, and this is how we're going to wrap up today, we've got to talk about some terms. And Brandon, this is where we're going to start talking about phase changes. Three terms. So guys, term one, number one is this, reversible process. Now guys, you've got to be very, very careful with this definition. When you hear reversible process, you may be thinking a process that can go this way and a process that can go this way. And that's not what this means. A reversible process is a process in which it is possible to return a system to its original state with no net change in the system or surroundings. Can I show you a non-example? <laughs> It'll help, I promise. It's not just me being mean. 
Are you guys okay? So non-example, we'll draw it small. No. Oh, you like this in blue. Non-example, this. Now you all know that's the ball rolling downhill. Guys, a non-example is this. Let's think about why. What does that ball have to do to roll downhill? Roll. Nothing. It's just going to go. Because if we want that ball to roll back uphill, what has to happen? The, the surround me has got to push the ball back uphill. And that changes me, right? If the ball were heavy enough, I'm sweating, I'm eating carbs to have enough energy. It's got to do work in order to push the ball. I have, the surroundings have got to do work. This is a non-example. A ball rolling downhill can't roll spontaneously. Ooh, can't roll spontaneously back uphill, right? Guys, this goes one direction downhill to go the other direction. The surroundings have got to change. The surroundings have got to dump energy into the ball to get it to go back up. So what does it look like then if we're talking about a system that is reversible? Here you go, Brandon. An example of that would be this. A cup of ice water at zero degrees Celsius. Let's draw a picture. Let's not do that. Guys, a cup of ice water at zero degrees Celsius. Throw a couple ice cubes in there for effect. And we could throw some water molecules in there that I'll just draw as dots. So guys, if you've got a cup of ice water at zero degrees Celsius, is it freezing or melting? Both. At zero degrees Celsius, and follow along with me. This is important. At zero degrees Celsius, are you comfortable with the idea that it's freezing and melting? How can that be? So let's talk. Which has more energy? The molecules in the water phase or the molecules in the ice phase? The water phase. The amount of energy that they have is the amount of energy that it took to break the intermolecular forces and set them free. Does that make sense? Okay, now. What happens if we could turn this into a video? Well, we know that the water molecules are bouncing all around, right? And let's say this water molecule crashes into the surface of the ice. When it crashes into the surface of the ice, what does it do? Releases energy. Where does the energy go? Into a molecule that's in the ice phase. And when they crash, this molecule loses energy and sticks. It's now frozen. But where did that energy go? Into one of these molecules that is now free in the liquid phase. So which one gained more, which one did, which one's bigger? The amount of energy the ice molecule gained or the amount of energy the water molecule lost? They're the same. That means there's no net change. Do you see it? Now here's the question. If you come back tomorrow, what's this cup of ice water going to, assuming there's a lid on it so it can't evaporate. Guys, what's this cup of ice water going to look like tomorrow at zero Celsius? The same. It's not going to change at zero Celsius. So guys, we are at this magic condition where a forward process and a reverse process are happening in exactly equal rates and canceling each other out. And guys, you may have saw it come up on the board because it clicked too fast. What do we call that condition? Equilibrium. Guys, this is a system at equilibrium. So systems at equilibrium are reversible. You okay with that? Now, guys, here's the problem. Can I get rid of my... That picture's functionally worthless to you, right? Okay. So we're back here. There's our ball. How come the ball gets progressively bigger? 
I don't know. It, it's a, oh, the snowball. I like it. So, guys, what's that ball going to do? Roll downhill. But wait a minute. Don't miss this, Jacob. May, can I make that ball go back uphill? Is it reversible? Oh. No, no, no. We're not even talking spontaneous yet. Can I make that ball roll back uphill? Yes. So does that make it reversible? No. Guys, don't confuse reversible with you can kick it in the other direction. The important distinction is this. No net change. And Jay, I just saw you kind of going that way, and I wanted to make sure you were here. So, guys, this is critical. Don't confuse reversible with forcible. You can make anything go backwards if you bang on it hard enough. That doesn't make it reversible. The thing that makes it reversible is the fact that the forward and backward processes are happening in such a way that they're canceling each other out with no net change. Don't confuse that with being able to force it the other way. Do you see the distinction? Okay. Term number two, irreversible. So guys, an irreversible process then is a process which cannot simply, cannot be undone simply by reversing the events that caused it. Now guys, I know we just talked about this, but let's make sure you're clear. That does not mean it can't go backwards. It can go backwards, but it goes backwards through a different path, a different process. And this backwards process has different heat and work values associated with it. doing can I show you some examples of some irreversible processes are you ready to do that is that okay okay so guys here come irreversible processes now let's make sure we're clear if it's irreversible can it go in the other direction yes but not through the same path you ready for the aha moment There they are. Guys, these are all irreversible processes. Think about it. Can you make a ball roll uphill? Yes, but you have to push it. It's a different pathway. Can you take carbon dioxide and water and turn it into methane and oxygen? Yes. You can. It takes, it takes a lot of work. You physically have got to get the carbon dioxide and the, the water, water to bond differently, differently to turn back, back into methane and, and into oxygen. oxygen. Because this, because this is unsimilar, unsimilar to what happens inside, inside a plant called a photosynthesis. photosynthesis. Instead, Instead of turning, of turning it into methane and oxygen, it turns it into carbohydrates and oxygen, and that's photosynthesis. photosynthesis. But, but, guys, the, the idea, idea is you can you take, take, take this reaction, CH4 plus O2, form CO2 and H2O, and we can go the other way. We can take carbon dioxide, we can take water, and we can make them go this way. But can and we just take carbon, carbon dioxide, dioxide and, and add some water to it and turn it into methane? methane? No, that no, 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 would be really cool if we could because we would have an amazing, amazing source of energy. energy. We can burn methane in cars. cars. 
natural gas vehicles. Natural vehicles. vehicles. But we can't, we do, can't that. do that. It takes it a takes lot of work and a lot of energy to make them go in the other direction. direction. Now, guys, what about nails rusting? Rust. Can we take a rusty nail and recover the iron and get rid of the oxygen? Yes. But it takes a lot of really complicated chemistry to do it. Now do you see the connection? We've just said, guys, two very important things about these things. What did we just establish about these things? They're all irreversible. Now let's be clear. Can we undo these things? Oh, baby. It takes a lot of work. So these are irreversible. They can go the other way, but they don't do it through the same path. So these are irreversible. But what else are they? They're spontaneous. And guess what? That is not an accident. That is the next thing in your notes. Guys, spontaneous processes are processes which always occur on their own with no outside assistance. They only occur in what we call the spontaneous direction, and by definition, they're irreversible. It is not spun. Hold that thought. Let's let people write this down and then let's talk. Okay? You guys all caught up? How about now? Good? Okay, guys, Matt's question is critical. He said, what about the ice melting? Is the ice melting spontaneous? There's our ice melting. So guys, to answer the question, read again the definition of spontaneous. It happens with outside intervention. It goes in what we call the spontaneous direction. And it's irreversible, which means it can't go the other way on its own. So now let's talk. What about ice melting Do, or melting and freezing at zero? Not melting, melting and freezing at zero. So guys, does the melting and freezing happen with no intervention? Yeah. Does it have a direction that it always goes? No, it goes both directions. Is it irreversible? No. So is the melting and freezing of ice a spawn? I was afraid of that. Is the melting and freezing of ice, one more, one more. Is the melting and freezing of ice a spontaneous process? It is not. But what is it? It is an equilibrium process. So now guys, this is maybe a way to think about it. This process goes this way and this way all on its own. And when they're going both directions all on their own, I think some of you are thinking, doesn't that mean they're spontaneous in both directions? See what I'm saying? They are. But because they're spontaneous in both directions, those are what we call reversible equilibrium processes. For it to truly be spontaneous, it can only be spontaneous in one direction, and not spontaneous in the other direction. Do you see the distinction? So now we've really got two different kinds of reactions. We've got equilibrium reactions, which are reversible, which means they go both ways at the same time. And then we've got spontaneous reactions that have a direction they always go and a direction they never go without being pushed. Go ahead. Yeah, so let's do this. Let's take our cup of ice and now let's heat it up to 20 degrees Celsius. Now what happens? It melts. 
but it doesn't freeze. So now is it spontaneous? Yes, because it melts on all on its own and it doesn't freeze all on its own. So by changing the temperature, we just took a non spontaneous, we took a reversible process and made it spontaneous by giving it a direction. And Kami, it's interesting, that's actually what you're going to miss when I'm gone that day, you'll see in the screencast, is spontaneity is temperature dependent. And that's what they're actually, we're going to be doing at the end of this, is we are going to determine at what temperatures are reactions spontaneous and at which temperatures are they not spontaneous. And then what you'll find out is between spontaneous and not spontaneous is equilibrium. Yeah, go ahead. Um, would heating the water up to 20 degrees not be considered giving it a bunch of no, what it's considered is, is resetting our conditions. It would be the nudge before the nudging. So if we heat this up to 20, we've created a new, a new scenario is not the right word. We've created a, a new reality. And then we talk about what happens at that reality. We know that we've got to do work to get it there in the same way that if we've got our ball, we had to do something to get it there. Yeah. But once it's there, then we start talking about it. Does that make sense? Okay, how you guys doing? All right, so now guys, let's just let, we're, this is how we're gonna wrap things up. Not like that, um, like this. Get rid of this, I'll bring it back in a minute. Holy smokers, what is that? Um. There we go. All right, so guys, here's what we've got. We got some eggs. These eggs are hovering in space in a hand. They're being held. So guys, if we open the hand and let go of the eggs, what are they going to do? They're going to fall. Now guys, do we have to do anything to force those eggs to fall? Do we have to nudge them? So is the falling of the egg spontaneous? It falls all on its own. So we let go of these things, the eggs fall all on their own, and they crack and they shatter and they make a mess, and that is spontaneous. So we just observed a, a process that is spontaneous. Now, is it reversible? Yeah. Oh, no. No. Ah, now we're, so let's talk about this. Could we take these eggs, gather up the yolks and the whites, weld together the, the shell, put everything back together exactly as it was, and lift it back up to the hand? Could we do that? Yeah. Yes. But it's going to, and I mean this, it's going to take a lot of work, right? It's going to take a lot of work. So does it take any work to just let the eggs drop? No, but it does take a lot of work to make it go. So can we make it go backwards? Yes, but does it go through the same pathway? No, because the work that has to go in is different. So the eggs will never do this. They'll never re-blend themselves and go back up. So here's what we now know using all of our ideas. The dropping and shattering of an egg, is it reversible? Is it reversible? Do eggs drop and rise and drop and rise and drop and rise? All? No, it's irreversible. And because it's irreversible, it has got a direction that it always goes down and it's got a direction it never goes up. And so we call the direction that it always goes the spontaneous direction and we call the direction that it never goes the non-spontaneous direction. See how all those ideas come together? So it's irreversible, which means it's not at equilibrium. And because it's irreversible, it's got a spontaneous direction and a non-spontaneous direction. But we can force it to go in the non-spontaneous direction, but it needs we need to do more work or maybe add some more heat. Do you see the distinctions? We're done. Okay, so guys, with all of that said, we need to look at some homework.
And guys, this is your homework. But understand, just a second, understand that this is not just today's homework, it's next times as well. So you are going to do what of this you can. 